Good morning, and thank you for coming to this uh, year round table that I, I have organized uh, in the framework of the Employment Policies and Labor Market course. These are a type of activity that for which I usually invite uh, experts, leading experts in a given topic. Uh, I have already explained to my students the importance of human capital investment in recent decades. Uh, it's a type of investment that increasingly explain uh, labor market performance, labor market trajectories. And as education has expanded, there has also been a transition from education to work has become more cumbersome, more plagued with problems like early school leaving, neither in education, employment or training. And overskilling or education is another problem. I mean, an inefficient investment in human capital that has some consequences for uh, wages. There is a wage penalty that is associated with over education, over skilling, uh, there may be problems for job satisfaction, and it may not be as frictional or transitory as many people think. So I think it's an issue, it's an increasing issue in, in the study of um, uh, the transition from education to work. And there's an additional element for this problem in the transition from education to work, that is, it may not be the risk of falling into over education, educational mismatch or overskilling may not be equally distributed by race or social origin or migrant origin. So there is an issue that maybe it may be a new dimension of labor market inequality. And this is the reason that I have invited these well-known scholars in the study of educational mismatch. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to them. Uh, Maria Angeles Davia is Professor of Applied Economics in the University of uh, uh, Castilla-La Mancha. She is a labor economist who has focused or done a lot of study with micro data analyzing uh, Spain and other EU countries and other issues like uh, youth poverty or other dimensions of, uh, or of youth transitions because, I mean, labor market one is not the only transitions in youth. Uh, she has published her research in not only in labor economics journals, but also in demography or uh, sociology journals like European Journal of Population, Social Science Research, Work, Employment, and Society. And she has worked in collaboration with Simus McGuinness, uh, who is a research professor at the Economic and Social Research Institute in Dublin and a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Studies at the University of Bonn and uh, adjunct professors in the Department of Economics at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, most of his research is on uh, economics of education and labor economics, and I think he's one of the leading scholars in educational mismatch to the point that, in my view, there are very few academic references that do not cite his work. So I think he's a really well-known scholar in educational mismatch. He has published his research in uh, journals like Economics of Education Review, Applied Economics, or the British Journal of Industrial Relations. So thank you very much for accepting my invitation. I think we are going to learn quite a lot from the reasons why uh, over education may exist and the results of this phenomenon for inequality, which are the main issues. They are going to talk uh, approximately 20, 30 minutes each of them, and then the room will be open to questions. So welcome to our course. Well, um, good morning, and thanks, Luis, for the invitation. It's fantastic to be back in, in Barcelona again. So uh, we don't have a, a huge amount of time, so I'm really going to just talk in, the, really, uh, in an overview in terms of why are we worried about what is mismatch, um, what are skill mismatches, uh, why should we be, be worried about them. I'm going to focus in particularly on educational mismatches and... Um, Really this, well, what do we know in terms of what causes them? What are the drivers and the, the causal factors? And what don't we know? What, what are the gaps in the literature of this thing, of which uh, there are many? Um, so I'm going to talk, um, introduce um, the, the concepts of skill mismatch, the different types of skill mismatch that exist, some of the stylized facts that the research has uh, produced. I'm going to then look at how, what, where is policy focused on this area uh, and, and demonstrate that there actually is a paradox that the policy focus at a European level tends to be where the evidence is thinnest and there are a lot of assumptions underlying that. I'm gonna deal with the sort of the view, well, is it the case that over-education is driven just by having too many graduates and too, too rapid an expansion of the supply side? Um, and then really what, what is missing in terms of what do we not know in this field of literature before summing up? So skill mismatches is a very broad term. It, it generally talks about 
the types of disequilibrium between the demand and the supply for labor. Uh, and it can be measured in very different ways. Some of those measurements are measured from the perspective of the worker, others from the perspective of the firm. Um, so from the perspective of the, the worker, the one we hear about most are educational mismatches, over-education. Uh, this is where someone is deemed to have too much human capital for their job. So this is a graduate in a job that only need, requires a high school diploma. The flip side of that is under-education. Uh, so the person is deemed not to have enough uh, education or human capital for their job. So this is someone with a high school diploma in a job that typically requires a university degree. Then we have the concepts of overskilling and underskilling. These are very similar. Uh, the only difference uh, between these and educational mismatches is the, the question that is asked. The question that is asked for these um, uh, measures is to what extent do your skills and abilities match uh, your, the requirements of your job? Someone who is overskilled is telling us they have unused skills and abilities. They have more skills and abilities relative to what the job requires. Someone who is underskilled tells us, well, the answer to that question is, I don't have enough skills and abilities to do my job competently. And obviously, underskilling and undereducation will be correlated. They're, they're, they're different ways of measuring the same thing. Overskilling and overeducation will be correlated. They're different ways of uh, measuring the same thing. We have the concept then of horizontal mismatch. This is where, for example, an engineer is working outside their field of study. For example, they're employed as a librarian. And then we look at the measures of skill mismatch that are measured from the concept of the firm. Uh, so we have skill gaps. So this is where the employer tells us, my workforce do, is not competent enough to do the job sufficiently that, that I require them. Uh, and that is related to the concepts of underskilling and overeducation, undereducation measured at the level of the employee. And then we have skill shortages. This is where the firm says, I cannot fill posts because of a lack of uh, skilled external candidates applying for the post. So there's a whole raft of these different measures of skill mismatches, and they all are trying to measure the extent to which there is disequilibrium between uh, labor demand and labor supply. So why are we worried about uh, these uh, skill mismatches? Well, in theory, all forms of skill mismatches can be potentially damaging to the worker uh, and to, to the firm and to the macro economy. If we focus just on over-education, what we find when we look at over-education is that over-educated workers, so graduates and non-graduate jobs, consistently across all countries will earn a wage penalty between 10 and 20%, so then between 10 and 20% less than graduates who are in graduate jobs. They tend to have lower levels of job satisfaction, and they tend to have a higher rates of job mobility. They're more likely to quit or be fired. And from the employer side, that's problematic because lower wages tell us that there's a productivity ceiling that, that's been imposed on the worker. So uh, productivity is lower within the firm, profitability is going to be lower within the firm, and higher labor costs are going to be higher within the firm due to the higher turnover of staff. And then when we look at the macro economy, if we think that we have up to one in four workers on average earning a pay penalty of between 10 and 20%, so we're saying they're, they're, they're not matching their productive capacity uh, by a margin of 10 and to 20%. And if you add that up across the entire economy, that's potentially a, a large amount of lost macroeconomic output. So it's, it, we should be worried about these things. But when we look across the literature, across all these uh, forms of skill mismatch, it's very, very skewed. Um, and, and you can see there, we have two papers, one from the Journal Economic Surveys, uh, with an update uh, for 2017 to 2022 for a forthcoming book chapter. And you can see that most of the research is skewed towards studies of over-education. So 70% of recent years of all papers published in this area were in over-education. If you look at the papers on skill shortages, just 3%, we could just find two papers on skill shortages published in the last five years. This is not because scholars think over-education is the only thing that matters. It's, it's the only thing that's easily estimatable. Uh, if we have a labor force survey with occupation and earnings, we can measure over-education in every country. All of the rest of these phenomena require specific survey questions and approaches. So that's why the literature is skewed so badly uh, as it is. And we look at the distribution of studies by country relative to the incidence of over-education. Again, this tells us that it is not the countries that have the worst problem that have the most estimates. So if you look on the right-hand side, the country with the most estimates is Belgium. But they're, in terms of they have a mid-level instance of over-education. 
but Belgium has the best data. Uh, so they're able to generate lots of studies of overeducation. If you look at Ireland, we have one of the worst problems with overeducation up here. Almost 40% of new graduates are overeducated in Ireland, but we have very few studies because our data infrastructure isn't as good. What are the stylized facts associated with all of these things? Well, this is the, these are results from a, from a Journal of Economic Service paper where we looked across all of the literature. And we found that on average across countries, one in four workers uh, were overeducated. Uh, that was based on 241 estimates. And the average pay penalty is 13.5%. So an overeducated worker on average will earn 13.5% less than one that is matched with similar levels of edu education. For undereducation, the incidence is lower and we don't find a wage effect. So there doesn't look to be a productivity issue there with undereducation. Overskilling, similar to under overeducation, about one in, one in five workers, but a lower pay penalty. And then with underskilling, we didn't find any productivity effects. When, in, when we look at the literature on skill shortages, there is virtually nothing, nothing that links skill shortages with low productivity. And that's an important point. So where's policy focused? When we look at what the European Commission or, or national governments uh, do on the areas of skill shortages, what, where are the actions focused? And we looked at this in, in a previous paper, and we found that in any, so the country-specific recommendations are the, are the national reform program recommendations. These are recommendations that the European Commission give to each country and said, this is what you need to do on your labor market policy. And when we looked at that, basically all of the focus was on skill shortages and skill gaps. Um, so even when a country-specific recommendation wasn't talking, didn't mention skill shortages, it was clear to us that's what they were referring to. So this is the concern uh, for, for policy, and all of these countries specifically mentioned um, skill shortages and tackling skill shortages in their CSRs and their, our, their national uh, reform program recommendations. So here's the, here's the problem is that when we look at policy, despite the fact that we have now hundreds of studies that show that overeducation is damaging for, in terms of imposing a wage penalty, we have some evidence of productivity effects and job satisfaction, it's completely ignored from, in terms of where policy is focused. Policy is focused on the area where the evidence is thinnest. These, this, this area of skill shortages, even though I've shown you that there's basically no literature on skill shortages, and certainly nothing demonstrated that skill shortages are a cause of negative productivity. Why is that the case? Well, um, when we talk about educational mismatches, there's a problem with politicians think these guys are telling us there are too many graduates and the, the solution to this is to, to really um, start restricting the growth of edu higher education. And politically, uh, that would be a very difficult thing for anyone to say, but that's not actually what the evidence tells us. There's also this assumption that well, we're fixing, we're fixing skill shortages, so we have generated a new apprenticeship program that will also deal with the problems of overeducation because there's more qualified graduates in areas where they're required. There's limited evidence to support that. Uh, there's also the case, as Louise said, that some policymakers believe that this, these mismatches are a transitory issue. They will go away over time. People, oh, okay, I'm in a bad job. Um, but they, they soon figure out uh, that's a mistake and they move on to a matched employment. That's not the case. If you are mismatched, you are more likely to job separate and you're more likely to enter into another form of mismatch. And also, obviously, employers are a very strong lobby group uh, in countries and within the EU. In terms of what causes overeducation, really the literature is very patchy. Um, we have lots of studies that show, well, this is the wage effect, this is the job satisfaction effect, this is the mobility effect. Very little actually telling us what are the drivers. There's been some attempts at this. Basically, what we see is overeducation tends to be countercyclical. It tends to be lower when educate when one employment uh, is lower. Sorry, it's procyclical. It's also influenced by the the form of the educational system. If there's more vocational education within the system, the lower the edu overeducation rate in the country. And also, uh, crucially, we find that overeducation, particularly among females, is much lower in countries that have good uh, childcare. And, uh, and, and legislative protections for, for, for people going off on, um, to current, for current reasons. Is overeducation driven by too many graduates? No, it's not. Um, so this is the, again, looking at countries, um, if you look at the last three columns, over, overeducation isn't increasing everywhere. So if you look around, this is the EU 27, uh, so the third column, these are the countries where overeducation was increasing. 
Um, some of them had a negative trend, some of them had no trend at all. But if we look at the second column, we can find that actually over-education of young, younger people in countries tended to be lower uh, relative to older cohorts. That would tell us actually over-education amongst young people is falling as education is expanding. Um, and actually we find that to be the case. So this is ISCIT level. These are the proportion of graduates averaged across the EU 27 over time. Uh, and that's the red line. You can see that that education expansion is increasing. But we can see that the over-education rate there is actually falling amongst that cohort. Uh, we have another paper, two papers um, where we use panel data to actually show that this is this negative, there is a negative causal relationship between ed education expansion and over-education. It is not driven by having too many graduates. But there is a role for the supply side in the, all of this because even if you have exactly the, the, the demand and supply for, of graduates in the labour market is exactly matched, you will still have mismatches because a lot of mismatches due to an information asymmetries, that there, that there is not good information and institutions matching uh, employers with employees. And in that sense, educational institutions uh, that link the graduates with employers in the labour market are crucial. Some of our research has shown, for example, that you're much less likely to be overeducated if you get your job through a university placement or through a, 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 a a university work placement or through a university uh, career service. You are much more likely to be overeducated if you get your job through a private recruitment agency, through family or friends, uh, and also through uh, public employment agencies. So having good matching institutions in labour markets, and this is some of Maria's research we'll talk to, are crucial in terms of reducing uh, the incidence of, uh, of skill mismatches because they remove the information asymmetries that cause a lot of the problem in the first place. Also, the components of a degree are important. The more practical learning you have within research programs, the lower the, le the level of over-education and, um, and, and over-skilling. So we found that the higher the, the share of research programs, work placements, emphasis on facts and knowledge, problem-based learning within degree programs, the more practical skills that graduates are given within their courses, the lower the level of, of, of over-education. And th those components were much more important in arts degrees uh, than in STEM degrees. So they, that having these practical components within arts degrees were particularly important because over-education is, not, is, is, not, is non-random with respect to field of study. And we have a, another paper coming out very shortly to show that VAT, uh, having a high share of VAT within an, a labour market educational system is also important for, removing over, for reducing over-education. And finally, I'll sum up to say, what I, everything that I've talked about is to look at over-education and educational mismatches from the perspective of the supply side. What's, what is the, is there too many graduates? Are the universities having, doing enough to place their, their students? What is going on with the supply side with university courses? The literature completely ignores the demand side of the equation. And this is where we need, and all of these things that I've put here are potentially drivers of mismatch. The organization of firms within, uh, of labor within firms. Obviously, you would imagine if firms have more team working um, relative to having people doing uh, isolated, repetitive tasks in a labor market, there's going to be uh, lower levels of mismatch. Job quality is assumed to be increasing over time. It isn't uh, in lots of countries. Uh, so we need to look at the quality of jobs that are being created. Contractual arrangements are going to be important. Obviously, if you have more fixed term and temporary contracts, people have lower tenure uh, and they're more likely to be uh, mismatched and move from one area of mismatch to another. Recruitment policies are important. One study by uh, Satifop showed that 49% of firms in the EU reported having problems hiring graduates. When they looked below the, the, the bonnet of that, only 12% of those were genuine skill shortages. The rest of them were driven either by inefficient HR practices or the firms not offering the competitive wage. So there's lots that we don't know around this. When I, I was, Louise asked me to talk about the drivers of skill mismatch, and I'd probably be able to talk about more about what we do know than what we don't know. But what we're missing, certainly supply side institutions are important. Uh, the composition of, of education is important. But we really need to get start getting a handle in the literature. What's going on in the demand side of the economy? What are employers doing to contribute to the problems of skill mismatch? And actually, what is their role uh, in, in resolving this uh, from a policy perspective going forward? Thank you, Ross. It's been very rich. This is just the, the end of your presentation.
It is. Okay, thank uh, you. And that's the conclusion. So, is the key. <laughs> so, hello, everybody. I would like, first of all, to thank um, Luis for his invitation. I am absolutely thrilled. And, um, well, I mean, it's a, it's a honor being uh, invited to Pompeo Fabra. It's a honor to be invited by Luis Ortiz, who is a, a colleague I admire a lot. And it's a honor, of course, and some, sometimes scary as well, to be invited together with Seamus. Because Seamus, for me, is a master in these kind of issues. And because he is an international renewed um, scholar in the educational mismatch, he is as well um, the external advisor in the research project that you can see here, which has been funded by the Spanish Ministry of, uh, of Science. So um, part of the evidence the evidence I'm going to, to speak about today is related to the topic he's been, uh, I mean, to the project and to the topic he's been uh, um, talking about. Actually, I got a copy of his slides three days ago, and then I made sure my presentation fits into, into this. And as well, um, some of the evidence I'm going to show you is part of um, um, the results of a research stay I could do this summer in Esri, and um, he was a wonderful host. So I really want to, I really appreciate that. So um, I'm going to go through very quickly through the Spanish context and how the education expansion has um, evolved in, in the past uh, decades and what is the situation of young people in relation to that education expansion. Then I will remind some of Seamus' messages in his presentation because I will be talking about Spain and um, the inequalities across fields of study, the extra education like graduate education, supporting job search policies, the region of origin, and the patterns of geographical mobility. And none of those differences is neutral to family background. So most of the evidence I'm going to show is about how family background measured by the level of education of parents is influencing um, the risk of overeducation in young graduates in Spain, for which I will be using EILU, the Encuesta de Inserción Laboral de Universitarios, which is a special survey run by INE, the National Statistical Office, uh, describing the labor market insertion of university graduates in Spain. I will briefly present this and focus on my results, which I hope will be uh, well knitted with Seamus' presentation. So you see here that Spain, um, this is the, um, the proportion of active population in Spain, both adults at the left side and um, young people at the right side, with tertiary education in the past 30 years. And you can see that for adults, there has been a continuous increase in the proportion of active population with tertiary education, higher for women than for men. But for young people, it has not been always the case. And during several years before the crack in 2008, we had even, you know, um, um, a lower proportion of people with um, tertiary education. But now we are, of course, in a, in a new track. And the proportion of active population in the age group 25-29 with tertiary education is really high for international standards. It's about 60% of women and 48% of men. If we compare the, com I mean the if we compare the composition of employment and the composition of jobs, we will see something that Seamus was mentioning, the fact that over-education is not only driven by the education expansion. So the pink line is the proportion of employed people with tertiary education. They are adults, males and females, in Spain. The gray line is the proportion of adults working in ISCO 1, 2, or 3. So they are uh, managers, professionals, or associate professionals. They are working in jobs which are supposedly requiring um, university education or tertiary education. If the mismatch was only due to the proportion of people with uh, the right uh, education attainment, then over-education levels in Spain should have been negative <laughs> in the beginning of the 19th, and they are not. The red line, the dotted line, is the proportion of young, is the proportion of adults with tertiary education who do not work in managerial positions or professionals. So we have a problem of over-education, which goes beyond the supply side. And Spain, in this map, 
This map is taken from your table, Seamus. So you can see that um, Spain is one of the countries where over-education is higher for young people than for the rest of the population. So we are not in, in this majority of countries. We have a problem of over-education in young people. Supply matters and policies helping supply and demand to meet are very important. That's one of the lessons from Seamus' presentation just a few minutes ago. And we see that job search methods are very important. There's a wide evidence on that. And Seamus has also mentioned that mismatches across course content are very important. So I'm going to go through these differences. Uh, job search methods, fields of education, type of program, type of university, and the acquisition of extra skills, plus geographical mobility none of which is neutral to social class. Because in those issues, social class or the family background has a very important role. And because it is, as Seamus has shown us before, has got important consequences as wage penalties, low job quality, job satisfaction, and job separations, then we are dealing with something that is causing potentially large inequalities for the future. So I'm going to use these labor market, um, the university labor market insertion survey. And um, I'm going to deal only with part of the survey, which is for bachelor graduates. I'm not dealing with the master's graduates. And uh, in the results I'm going to show you, they are framed in this project I'm, I'm working on. Um, you will see that I'm working only with young people. So they, they are recent graduates in 2014. I am observing them in 2000, I'm, the survey is observ observing them in 2019. And this survey combines um, registered information from the university information system with social security records, public employment services, municipality records, and of course a questionnaire. In the questionnaire, there are subjective questions about the level of education that the person thinks is appropriate for developing his or her job. So I, the type of mismatch I'm going to work with is over-education. Over-education is um, measured, as I'm going to define now, as the proportion of uh, persons who are university graduates, but uh, they are think they are not working in a job that requires university education. Mm -hmm. And there are other types of uh, education mismatch that can be observed in this survey. I'm not going to go through them, but I just want you to know that this survey can be used as well to study skills underutilization, knowledge underutilization, and field of education mismatch. I've done some, we have done in my, in my team, some work on field of education mismatch as well, but I'm not going to cover that. So the literature about, um, the literature about over-education and family background is quite wealthy. And uh, we will see that the determinants of uh, over-education are not evenly distributed across family uh, background. I think there's some literature on that um, in Spain from um, Capsada Monsec and from Luis as well, and uh, in some other countries. I'm particularly um, following one from Germany. I will, I will tell you afterwards. And so in this survey, young people are asked about their first job after graduation and the job they are holding four years after graduation. In the case of the first job after graduation, 30% of them say, report, that the most adequate level of education for their first job was not a university degree. And those are in the gray area in the graph. And four years later, only, only, 21% of graduates report that they are working in a job that doesn't require university, um, a university degree. Sometimes, about 20-something percent of the cases, the first job is the current job, so they haven't moved across jobs. But in other situations, most of the cases, yes, they have moved across jobs. So that is the question. In your opinion, what is the most appropriate level to perform this job? And that's the definition we're going to use for, yeah, for over-education. So I'm going to show you several um, figures, and they describe the proportion of people that say that they are 
first job after graduation didn't require a university degree. And they are split all times by two types of categories. Persons who have, uh, whose parents are highly qualified, at least one parent has tertiary education, and the rest. They are called non-highly qualified parents. And in the sample, they are more or less 50-50%. So they are quite evenly distributed. And you can see here that, that the proportion of over-education is lower in those who have uh, highly educated parents, whereas it is much higher, about 42%, in those who have not a parent with higher education. So in the next graphs, I'm going to show you how this is distributed across skills, fields of education, and job search methods. And you will, you will see here that um, having graduate education, having high marks, and having a high level of English helps graduates to hold uh, an adequate position, and it particularly helps those, um, I mean, it helps those from uh, different uh, family backgrounds equally. Maybe English helps a bit more those with a less educated parental background. Then here we distinguish fields of education and type of university. Again, you've got the average down there, and I'm comparing the overeducation rates at the first job of people from different uh, fields. And you can see that health, health degrees are affected by the minimum level of overeducation. But here, the gap between uh, graduates with uneducated parents and the rest of graduates is larger than in other fields. And it's sometimes larger as well in social sciences and law. And probably this deals with the way in which the first job is looked for. So we will look at that later on. In STEM, it's not that difficult, that, that different, I mean. Here, we've got differences across um, whether the person did an internship and whether this internship became his first or her first job. And that is the top, the top thing, the top uh, part. Yes, I did an internship and it became my first job. My first job. Well, that's the most, the best way to overcome over education risks. Doing an internship and having a successful internship that becomes your first job. And it's not only very effective, but it's a relevant equalizer. It's a relevant social equalizer because it helps both types of graduates, regardless of their social origin. In the rest, it's not that easy or not that straightforward. For instance, we've got um, mobility. International mobility helps everybody during their education to reduce their risk of um, being overeducated. And then um, having studied in a different region may help as well everybody, but especially helps those who are remaining in, in other regions. I will be back to this idea later on. But the interesting thing is that if, you, if your first job is abroad and your parents are not qualified, you're likely to hold a non very good job in abroad when you, when you go for your first job. Whereas if you come from a different social class, yeah, your experience in your first job is completely different. So we see that the way in which we get our first position is very important. Related to this, this graph is about job search methods. And uh, I would say that there are certain job search methods, as Shemu said in his presentation, that are particularly bad, like what we call temporary work agencies or the private, um, pr the private agencies are the worst job search method. You can see here that it it is related or correlated with highest levels of overeducation. And the social gap here is not very large because they are so bad. But there is one way which is particularly good, which is public exams, oposiciones. And in the public exams, you see here, oops, uh, here, that they can be particularly good together with job banks, but the social gap is larger than in any other job search method. So they are very good but they actually um, contribute as well, or they are correlated with a certain social gap. So job search methods, the content of the course, the type of university, extra skills, English, everything counts. And 
all those characteristics may be correlated with social origin. So that's why we are interested on that. And we have driven, we have done some multivariate analysis, just fair, I mean, standard probit models. We are controlling for all the variables I have uh, showed you, and we are doing this analysis separate for people with low and mid-educated parents and with high-educated parents. Our estimates, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you may imagine that they are just consequent and uh, very in line with the descriptives I have just showed you. Um, there's a very, very tiny difference across genders. At this age, men and women behave very, very similarly in the labor market, so our outcomes are not so different. And um, marks contribute to reduce uh, the risk. High English, level of English contributes. Private universities have a higher, um, I mean, a lower level of, uh, of over, over education, and so on and so forth. I am, we are controlling for more and more control variables, and we show that the results are quite consistent with a descriptive analysis, so I will, I will move quickly through that. But by having done the analysis for two different samples, those with non-highly qualified parents and those with highly qualified parents, we are able, these are just the coefficients, and I'm insisting on the, on the ideas of before, we are able to do this. We are able to decompose the gap between over-education risk of uh, persons with uh, parents with a high uh, level of education and the rest. And the original gap is about 13 percentage points, out of which about between five and six are due to differences in the composition of the sample. They are like the displayed part. And about between 60 and 50% is the unexplained part of the gap. The explained part of the gap is measured by the differences in the composition of the sample because um, all those qualities that are more, that are drive, driving, driving a lower over education risks like studying health, um, going abroad while in education, having a good level of English and so on and so forth are more concentrated in families with highly educated parents. And by doing this, we are able to see which is the distribution of the variables that are explaining the explained gap, the explained part of the gap. You see that English, um, high English command is very important, probably not in itself, but because it is related with other things. And the average marks, the two yellow things, are about personal skills. They are very important and the distribution is not socially uh, neutral. Then the blue ones are the characteristics that are, deal with the education system. So uh, having studied in private universities is important, but the field of education is even more important than that and having gone through graduate studies. The gray areas are for job search methods. So those would be the part of the explained gap, which depends on the distribution of job search methods across social classes, and the green areas are for mobility, geographical mobility, for education and during education. They are, their impact is smaller than I would expect, but they could be combined with the usage and the, the command of English speaking, so maybe altogether they, they're part of the story. The gender part is very tiny, is this purple thing, this purple part. So you can see that in this part of the uh, career, gender is not having, um, is not defining a very, very um, important gap. So, four years later, parents and family still matters. And these results are uh, part of the project I did um, this summer in, during my stay in, in Esri. And we were looking particularly at um, mobility within the country and abroad for study during education and after education. And we distinguish early leavers and late leavers. Early leaver is a person who leaves his parental home to study uh, the, the, the degree. And then late leaver is a person who study in the parental home, in the parental region, and then moves somewhere else. And we distinguish metropolitan and non-metropolitan areas. So four years after the education uh, has finished, we can see people who have been working, I mean, studying in different regions from the area of residence 
and here as well working in their first job in different regions to their area of uh, residence, usual area of residence. And what we find is that the main trajectories that may have an impact on over-education are not evenly distributed across social class. So, 50% of uh, graduates with non-educated parents are always living in non-metropolitan areas, always. They live there, they study there, their first job is there, and their new job is there as well. They don't move. Movement is much more often the case in the other social class, no? <clears throat> in graduates with highly educated parents. They move more. They, first of all, if they don't move, they are very, I mean, they're more often living in metropolitan areas. They more often study in metropolitan areas and they work in metropolitan areas during all their careers, at least during that early period. They move more during education, after education, and they move more across jobs. Here, in this part, you could see they move more across jobs and they move more from non-metropolitan to metropolitan area and abroad. And because of these patterns of mobility, they get better results in terms of over education. The, mm, the impact of family background is tinier. I mentioned before, I was very quick, but it was, I, our estimates started with 10% gap. Then once you control for a lot of covariates, it's about 5% gap for the first job. Four, year la four years later is only 2%. So 2% points lower proportion of uh, over-educated if your parents are highly educated. And we run similar regression, just similar regression to the other. And the results for the mobility are, uh, as we expected, that the profiles that are more typical of highly qualified, I mean, children of highly qualified parents are also the profiles that reduce further the risk of over-education, which means, again, that there is a social gap even after four years, which is defined not only by the decisions in the labor market, but also by mobility. So many of the common drivers of uh, over-education are not neutral to social class. We are dealing with several of them, all of which are related to social class. About 50% of the gap in over-education is still unexplained. That's, um, that's interesting, because we could think of uh, non-cognitive skills or within occupation, know-how, or maybe the inheritance of family business, nepotism, discrimination. So there are many, many things that we could um, try to look at, if they were observable, of course, to understand better the nature of the social gap in these over-education stages. This is very important uh, as well, because as Seamus mentioned, they've got a lot of consequences in terms of wage gaps, wage penalties, job satisfaction. So policy measures could do a very, very good job in this area. General policies addressing uh, those uh, students who want to study health, STEM, expensive, uh, expensive um, studies, expensive because they take long, longer time or because they need public exams to get into the career. And as well, public universities are compelled to work more into internationalization and uh, skills acquisition, language acquisition, and internships. High quality internships are very good and are very good socializers, equalizers. So this is more or less uh, my, my story. The demand side would be very interesting as well, as Seamus mentioned, but all these issues are, are policy based. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm very sorry if I was, I took too much time, sorry. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Maria. I think it's been a fascinating story. Um, uh, I think both, both presentations have been really good in explaining the phenomenon and also giving a clue, a an image of the amount of inequality that could be associated. First of all, why it's so important? I mean, why it's not, not an illegible thing? And second of all, what are the implications and what may be the implications for inequality? I think it's been really, really clear. I really appreciate. So we now open the floor to questions. Uh, Hello, professors. Um, first off, thank you so much for your time. The presentation was really informative. I had a question for Dr. McGuinness specifically. At the beginning of your presentation, you talked about how the share of research concerning skills obsolescence, skills gaps, and skills shortages 
pale in comparison to overeducation, mainly because overeducation is much easier to measure statistically. I was wondering if you think that with the introduction of artificial intelligence in both the workplace and in many higher education settings, do you think that that um, gap or deficit in research is going to close gradually as employers are slowly going to start measuring things like technical competence and using AI tools or number of jobs which have been replaced not by new employees or by artificial intelligence? It's a great question and the answer I think is no um, because ultimately uh, to do research in these areas you, you need um, organized data. Um, yeah, there's, there is something to be got. So we're seeing big data being used a lot now, and, and we're using it. Uh, we, we are scraping uh, job portals um, to see what's happening with emerging technologies. That will sort of only get you so far in terms of you can see the incidence of AI jobs, the amount of competence, you know, the types of characteristics and skills that people are requiring. But really to be looking at the, at the implementation of AI within the, um, the labor market, we were talking about this last night, you need proper survey data. Uh, you need to be measuring, for instance, uh, the extent to which people's competencies and tasks, first of all, the extent to which technology has impacted uh, their, 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 their job and the extent to which then the, the task, um, the makeup of the tasks in their job has been changing over time because obviously one of the things that we're worried about is job displacement. Uh, so it's it's difficult to see um, how that can be done outside the context of organized surveys. Um, the, the issue of artificial intelligence has really become massive um, in, in the last couple of years. So for instance, I know that SETIFOP have now commissioned an add-on survey to their the second wave of their European Jobs and Skills Survey um, to, to look at the issue of artificial intelligence. Uh, that field work on the first second survey was done in 2022. What I will tell you is that um, only around 13% on average of workers say that technology is impacting their, their jobs at the moment uh, and also resulting in a change in the composition of their tasks within their employment. Um, and I would be cautious around this. I mean, you know, in 2013, we were told um, that 50% of all jobs were going to be automated based on the Frey and Osborne research. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, that, that, that was a complete exaggeration. Um, techno technological change has always been present. Um, and labour markets are always changing, and the composition of occupations is always being affected uh, by, by technological change, and whether that's robotics, whether that's automation. The question is whether AI is, is, is going to have such a, a revolutionary uh, impact that, 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 that some people are arguing. It will certainly have changed the composition of employment because organisations and firms that will be using AI, um, there, there's, there's going to be um, a, a legal framework that's going to be extremely... Um, difficult to navigate uh, and, and so anyone that's, that's employing or developing AI will certainly, there, there need to be more people employed within jobs, there'll be more lawyers for certainly uh, in, in the labour market as a, as a result of AI uh, to ensure that compliance takes place uh, and, and there will be new professions uh, certainly created by it but the, the question is to what extent will that dis displace current occupations? I think it's more questionable. What we see with technological changes, yes, it does change some tasks. It does replace some tasks within jobs. And, and generally that results in a, in a higher intensity in terms of the skill composition of jobs. Um, more jobs will be more complex, more value added. It does have a negative side and that it tends to also drive increased job insecurity. But um, no, I, I think we're gonna need, um, we're gonna need proper data uh, to be consistently uh, captured really to, to, to and, and it is important to monitor um, how, how AI actually impacts the labour market going forward. Um, but I, 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 I'm more cautious and more pessimistic, so more, more sceptical about what its impacts are going to be going forward than maybe so. So um, my question is for both of you. There are some papers in the literature that argue that over-education is more like to get the job, to get accepted to the job because it's more like credentials and so on and so forth. And over-qualification is more about the productivity side. That is, once you get in the job, how productive you are. Uh, what is your take in terms of like the relationship between over-education and over-qualification? Would you agree or do you think completely different? Thank you. Well, uh, well over-education and over-qualification are just two terms for the same thing, Omar, to be honest. I mean, um, so over-education is over-qualification. Now, the issues is over-education and over-skilling uh, two, two different things. 
Um, there are correlated and there's, there's weak correlations, but basically I suppose the question is about in terms of transitions. Uh, I, I view over education as being similar to unemployment in that it scars individuals. So it's not a good strategy to say, well, and this, this, is, this is some of the early literature argued around career mobility, uh, that people went in low in order to get experience, so they, become, they became um, purposely overeducated in order to gain key experience, and then they would become uh, matched later on in their career trajectory. Um, that has been disproven uh, in the sense that I've done work, and lots of other people have done work to show if you look at the transition pathways of people who are mismatched, again, they're more likely to be to, be, to quit uh, and more likely to move when they get another job to another state of, of mismatch. So it, I think it scars people uh, in the same way that unemployment does that. It gives a negative, puts a negative signal to the employer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the individual. We've also done work on measuring, using panel data to measure the state dependence of overeducation. Uh, in terms of uh, dynamics, uh, dynamic models, and there is high state dependence. Once you become overeducated in period X, you have a very high probability of being overeducated in period X plus one. So it is, I mean, this is some of the arguments that policymakers say, oh, don't worry about these guys. They'll, they'll, they'll figure out they've made a mistake and move on. Uh, but the evidence suggests actually it's very difficult to move out of a state of mismatch once you initially become mismatched. Yes, my question is for Professor Davia. Um, you were talking about the mobility of uh, jobs and studying within Spain, but what's the impact of the international mobility and also how can this mismatch, educational mismatch, impact uh, the brain drain that many, for example, southern European countries suffer respect northern European countries or the whole Western world respect the United States, which is an attractor of talent, and how it compares across other countries and uh, if other countries that are suffering a brain drain are also suffering an educational mismatch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Thanks for the question. I think I was too quick. I. I I was obsessed with not taking too much time, and I must admit that I was very, very quick. So what I've got here, yeah. So these are um, the results of our model. They are average marginal effects. So you could see that there is a reduction by six percentage points in the risk of overeducation for those who did some international mobility during their degrees. And it is also interesting here that um, having a new job abroad, uh, the first job abroad is related with a high proportion of uh, overeducation, like 20%, 20 percentage points more, which is a huge distance for those who are not following highly qualified um, parents. Um, in general, International mobility is good for both types of, of young people. And indeed, it reduces the proportion of overeducation once you go back oops, to Spain for your first job. Then, um, as regards the impact in, in brain drain, of course, there is an impact uh, particularly for so there's, there's a, double, a double component. There would be a brain drain for children of highly qualified parents because they get very good jobs when they work abroad. And for the other type, for the, for the other 50% of the graduates, um, studying in Spain and working abroad at the beginning could be a brain drain and a brain waste as well because they do not, often they do not get uh, well qualified jobs and uh, they use their first working experience to get, as well, knowledge of the language. At the end of the day, they are not working exactly on an, an adequate occupation, and um, they, have, um, they have problems of over-education. So in that part of the population, we would not be dealing with brain drain, but also with brain waste during part of the, project, of the process. Four years later, this is more or less equalized. Regarding the second part of your question, I'm afraid I don't have information on that on international basis. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to see how or to, to, 
yeah, to answer about how Spain compares in brain drain with other countries. Of course, I am aware that it is a problem. And when sometimes um, some, not, they're not, I mean, some people say, well, you see, the high levels of overeducation in graduates in Spain is due to the low quality of uh, university education in Spain. I always answer the same, which is if we were providing bad quality graduates to the labor market, they wouldn't get the jobs they get outside Spain. So maybe it's not that bad, no? But actually, I'm very sorry, I don't have a statistical reliable information on that. And so I'm sorry, but it's a really, really interesting topic to, to study, definitely. Thanks. I just wanted to touch on um, part of the McGuinness um, lecture, just in terms of the paradox of policies surrounding, like the particularly the Irish scenario, I think is quite interesting because there seems to be an obsession with tertiary investment and education and diversifying pathways into third level. And that problem of overeducation doesn't seem to be addressed politically through policies. Um, and I know you touched on different ways of getting better like educational matches for graduates, but I was wondering more specifically policies to combat overeducation. Is that attracting greater foreign direct investment or is it trying to stop the kind of cultural obsession with third level education um, and moving to more kind of diversifying routes into employment. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, ask a little bit more about that point. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and the answer is yes and yes, um, because there is a cultural obsession with higher education in, um, in Ireland and in the UK. And, and in, um, so, so that is seen as a second, we call it the bridesmaid approach, you know, of, of education where uh, parents I would see it as some sort of failure if their if their children uh, pursued uh, a vet, so, so, such as a post leaving certificate program as opposed to a third level degree, um, and that's a very difficult thing culturally uh, culturally to break because um, the evidence shows that actually if we had more people pursuing vet. Um, that the incidence of overeducation would probably uh, be lower because we can see when we look at the studies that are able to look and it's very difficult to get, to get data uh, that has these uh, that, that where we can measure the, the the differences in the composition across countries across time but when we do we see that countries with better vet systems and more defined vet pathways have lower incidences of overeducation that makes sense in the sense that you're giving people more labor market relevant skills um, then, then there's, there's going to be a higher fit and, and, all, and proper VAT will also include um, an element of work placement and as we've shown that's crucial a component for getting people integrated into the labour market where at the level that they should be. Um, and then the other issue is it, it comes back to the point I mean actually um, our job is job quality rising in a way that people think. Um, we have lots of foreign direct investment in Ireland um, lots of it is highly paid, but when you look at actually the levels and you look at measures of job complexity, um, jo average job complexity in Ireland is, is lower, but that's when we measure the proportion of job tasks that are high, le high level ICT, uh, uh, numeracy, literacy, it's actually not that, um, not, it's pretty low internationally, and that tells me the job quality uh, and FDI isn't as, um, while it's highly paid, uh, it's not necessarily uh, as productive as, as it could be. So certainly as it's going back, there is a lot to be done on the demand side. And I think you have to look at, countries need to look at their strategies around for foreign direct investment, uh, around the support for indigenous uh, firms. And that is has to be a part of the problem is that there is, is there really enough qualified, good quality jobs for young people uh, to enter into? Just because you have growing high wage growth within an economy, uh, does not necessarily mean that you have growing uh, job quality. So I think it's important uh, perspective from policy, or, as are our range of other demand side factors uh, that, that need to be looked at. Hi. Uh, the question is for uh, Professor Maria. Um, well, uh, find an appropriate database. It is complicated. So I saw that you used like a, a specific database, but I think, or well, I believe that there are a lot of things that you can, you can like a, find in your investigation, like in the part of education and social mobility. So the question is, it is about that, uh, what kinds of database uh, would you like to have for the next research? I mean, Hmm. Any specific on this part of education or labor market or uh, social mobility? 
the most important to believe. I see. So this is like the letter to Santa Claus, no? <laughs> or to the three wise men. Well, um, part of the story behind the numbers I've got, and part of the story in the 50% of the gap we are not able to measure, deals with non-cognitive skills, knowing how to deal with people, knowing which door you have to knock in, knowing how to be in a public, how to speak in, in a, to an audience, the know-hows of a profession. So um, the trajectory you're going to, to follow, uh, which is the occupational culture. So that's why probably there are so many, I don't know exactly how many, but uh, it is not uncommon to find a um, doctoral, um, a medical doctor who is the son of a medical doctor who is the son of a medical doctor. That, had, that doesn't happen by chance. So if we could measure here exactly the occupation of the parents and not just the education attainment, we could see these occupation um, yeah, similarities with, with parents. That could be absolutely great, of course. In the case of Spain, we are not uh, diverse enough in terms of nationalities in our young university graduates. So not many of our university graduates have um, um, immigrants, par immigrants uh, parents from an immigrant um, origin. That would be interesting as well, that, but that's not exactly them. The information, um, yes, so that's part of the information we've got, but it's very, very tiny proportion. But yes, I would, I would, I would like to see more information on the non-measurable skills or non-cognitive skills, which are also deal with uh, the question, um, the previous question. Some people consider themselves over-educated and are over-educated, but maybe they are not over-qualified because they are part of the non-cognitive skills that we cannot measure until next Christmas when I get my new data from, from the three wise men. Um, part of those are not observable. So there are non-cognitive skills that are not observable in the, in, the, um, in the surveys. So as part of the explanation is that we, we, we observe over-education, but observing over-qualification is something different. And the difference between both could be in these kind of non-cognitive skills that are not observable usually in the data set. So thanks for the question. And I hope the three wise men are, yes, listening. <laughs> Uh, I have a question on Ms. Uh, Davia. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because my question depends on whether I followed the presentation correctly. Uh, if um, the survey about over-education was made by uh, survey or um, questionnaires among um, uh, graduates, right? Could that, uh, could that be that maybe there is like a discrepancy between the sort of a perception of over-education between the students coming from families that have uh, prior uh, experience with education at uh, universities and the students that come from families that uh, uh, their parents are not uh, university educated, uh, meaning that uh, they perhaps come from background that's not that financially stable, so they might be a bit more sensitive to that. Well, thank you for your question. It's, um, um, yes, it's very, very interesting. I haven't thought about that. So the perception of over-education could vary depending on the quality of the information you have about the professional market you are dealing with or you are addressing. That's very interesting. I wish I could do something about it. Yes, definitely it's a, it's a, good, uh, it's a good point for future research. And I, I don't know if there is a way to control for that. But measure it objectively, mm -hmm. Yeah. So by comparing objective and subjective, maybe, yeah. So now I've got a, a new line of research, thanks to you, and um, a new methodological proposal from Professor McGuinness. So thanks indeed. Um, 
Hello again. Thank you for your presentations. I was just wondering if there's a gap in qualitative research about such topics, and if there is, what angle should qualitative research take about topics of educational mismatch and labor market and et cetera? Thank you. The, the, I don't know, maybe Luis, you would have a better ha handle on what's going on in the sociological journals, but um, typically th there is very little. I think the issue is more around trying to measure the incidence of it within a country uh, and then looking at data in terms of measuring its drivers. But there is, there is, yeah, there, there is a big gap there um, to, to be filled. Uh, I've not come across any qualitative studies. Well, I've given quite a few to referee by journals, so I haven't seen any. So yeah, it would be it would it, the issue the issue with qualitative uh, research, I suppose, with this is um, because it's such a large scale problem. Um, so if you have forty percent of, of young people um, that are entering the labour markets in some countries overeducated, then how do you how do you how do you get a qualitative design uh, that will give you a representative sort of view of actually what 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 are the drivers from the perspective of the young people in terms of what they think is causing or what are their motives um, for, for, for taking their current job or the level of regret uh, that they have in terms of, um, you know, if, if people are overeducated, do they care? Because there is an argument that some people become overeducated because of the intrinsic value of the job. Um, and, and that is certainly an aspect. Other people may make rational choices around work-life balance. Um, this is more of an issue with, with respect to females, but then, uh, how much of a, of a choice is it if, if they have to occupationally downgrade um, in order to to to, prov to prov have a work-life uh, balance. So there, I, I think there's a role for qualitative research. We, we've, we have lots of propositions in terms of what we think is happening. When we look at, we've used data on people's motives uh, um, in terms of job, but really to, 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 to validate a lot of those theories I think would be important <coughs> because um, maybe it's not such a big issue. Qualitative research would tell us actually if it could tell us that most most of people who are overeducated are perfectly happy, um, and you know, and and th that they're in their jobs for different reasons other than wages. The only thing that would tell me that that's not the case is the job satisfaction data would tend to be quite consistent. But yeah, it's an important it's an important gap in the research. But there are lots of gaps in the research, unfortunately. <laughs> It's been really suggestive. One, one for Simus and another one for, or a couple of one for Maria. Uh, one of the really interesting pieces of evidence that you have shown us is the general trend towards a decrease in uh, over education, uh, which is really interesting. And I want to what extent what some economists have called the great demographic reversal, this kind of a shrinkage of labor market entry cohorts that may be happening across um, OECD countries may have something to do with it. I mean, the far that the labor market entry cohorts are shrinking, are reducing, and to what extent this may have to do with that. It's a supply side reason. I don't know what extent it could be or not, uh, because it's a sort of a demographic phenomenon that has been associated with other things. Uh, so I wonder to if it could be associated with um, the risk of falling into application. That, that would be my question for Simus. Mm -hmm. and, and the, my, my couple of questions to, to Maria, one of them is, um, one is really interesting, the, the, what you have shown us uh, of the uh, social or differences in different fields of study, for instance, and one of the really uh, striking results is health, because health supposedly is something that is very occupational specific. I mean, uh, the fit between the training that you receive and whatever you do after is, is very strong. I mean, but, uh, this field being one of it is one one of the ones in which social orientation explains more. I mean, there's higher difference between the the graduates. This is what I have understood. One of the highest difference between the graduates have, uh, who have uh, highly educated parents and the graduates who do not have highly educated parents. So, what would be your explanation of the fact that in such a occupationally specific uh, field of studies, there is such a big, uh, such a large. Uh, Social origin, uh, such an elastic effect of social origin that we want to think. And another thing that I drew from your explanations is that 
Um, but I, perhaps I took it wrong. I, I, that is the uh, geographical mobility is a corrector of education naturally, but more for highly educated, more for graduates from highly educated origin than from graduates from lowly educated origin. Did I take it right? Yeah, that's that's interesting because I think it tells who can move. And um, I mean, Spain is well known to be, uh, now things are changing, but a country where geographical mobility has not been, uh, I mean, it was really high in the 60s and then it declined and there are huge regional differences in, say, unemployment rate. So uh, that's interesting because it makes me think if what is behind that is just a comment, no? If, if, if it, what is behind that is the possibility, the resources graduates from high, highly educated origin have for moving, that graduates from lowly educated origin may not have, for seizing opportunities for moving. So that's these are a couple of comments that I had. So these these are three comments. I don't know who is going to. So the issue with um, health. Indeed, uh, health and the STEM sometimes as well are very occupational specific fields. And the incidence of overeducation in those fields is very low. So to begin with, it's very, very low. Um, but because um, I was dealing in that, uh, these results are referred to the first job after graduation, it could be the case that uh, the graduates whose parents are highly educated might need not to face their first job until they find a proper job related to the field, whereas graduates from other fields might need to work in a different area in order to pay, for instance, for the preparation of the exams okay. that will, or the bank, um, um, or the bank jobs, the job banks that will provide them the opportunity to actually work in the sector. Wow. So in between, there might be some months in which one could wait until the right job arrives and the other might need uh, some, some, some help. So that's my, my explanation. And that's why in that field, public exams have so... Right, yes. because that's related to the role of public exams that supposedly are very neutral. I mean, they are, they are sold as neutral um, yes. ways of... But at the end of the day, they are not so neutral. Socially, they are... They yeah. are not so socially neutral because, uh, as you say, uh, depending on what type of state exams, yes. it takes a really long delay, which is possibly not affordable. Precisely. By, yeah. uh, no, yeah. I mean, you're thinking of the health, public health state exams. Exactly, exactly. This may be applied to other field studies like uh, law. Law, no? In I mean, law, those, you know. judges, yeah. That's interesting. So, Sorry yes, yes, that. yes, yes. So, in, yes, public exams. Are, are an option that are used, I mean, they are class neutral in the sense that the questions, of course, are yeah. class neutrals. But the process is very costly right, yeah. in terms of time and in terms of money, because it costs money to prepare the exams. And of course, the, the cost of opportunity is there. So um, that's why I think from 2021, I think, I don't remember very well, there is, um, a policy um, with uh, grants for young graduates who are preparing this kind of exams. I've been told, I don't, I don't know the details. I think the amount of, of money they provide is not very large, so maybe they're not making that difference, but it is a new policy addressing social inequalities, helping young graduates to prepare those exams and not to need to work so, for so long. And as for um, the origin, the region of origin, when we give the opportunity to uh, move um, for the first job and after that, we see what we see here. So first of all, we see that um, it's a question of origin and then it's a question of movement. Because here you see that the most common trajectory before the first job for um, graduates with non-highly qualified parents is always being in a non-metropolitan home region. Non-metropolitan means outside Madrid or Catalonia. I'm not able to, to isolate Barcelona, so Madrid or Catalonia. Whereas children of highly qualified parents are already more 
present in metropolitan regions, and they don't need to move. So to begin with, they don't need to move as much as others because they are already born, given that their parents already work in those regions, they're already born in those regions. So they've got an initial advantage on that. So they don't need to move so much. Mm. An interesting result as well we get is something about what I call boomerang kids, which is um, the, the, the possibility of going somewhere else to study and then going back to your, uh, to your uh, home region. And that's um, people who go, who are early leavers and go to a metropolitan area and then go back to the non-metropolitan areas. And for them, there is a, um, um, a penalty in terms of over-education. So if they go to somewhere else and they go back home, they will face the same labor market as the graduates who didn't move to study anywhere. So they go back to a region with difficulties. In that sense, after, even after they've made the effort, it doesn't pay because they go back to a non-metropolitan region where the opportunities are lower. So that's why my, my final point, and I was so, so quick, I didn't pay enough attention to this, was about uh, the demand. The demand is very important because public measures to support supply might be social equalizers, but the demand measures as well, if they are spread all over the country, they could contribute as well to reduce gaps across territories and not just across social classes. So that's my, that was my message. Thanks for the question because, yeah, I could express myself. Yeah, you've got me thinking there, at least to be honest. Uh, so the question is, um, if we get you right, you're saying because of the demographic shifts and the, and the drop in the birth rate is feeding through over time, you have lower numbers of young people entering the labor market um, and that's creating a lower competition for, for jobs, resulting in lower edu over education. Um, that's certainly a plausible hypothesis. I would say, though, that even though you have the demographic shifts in terms of the number of young people entering the labour market, maybe following the share of graduates within that, is still rising. Uh, so it's not clear to me that um, the, you know that that the number of graduates is, is, is not still increasing. As you know, even given the, the shrinkage in that cohort. If I if I if I remember rightly, we got that result in two papers. There was one in Oxford Economic Papers and another one in the Oxford Review of Education. It was something that we were worried about. And we did have a control in uh, for the share of, I'd have to check it, but I think it was the share of young people in education as a share of the overall labor market uh, to take account of, of, the, um, of the, um, the demographic effect. That, that, um, but then obviously the, the problem with that is that the labor market is shrinking as well. So I'm not too sure thinking about it. It's, it's actually a good control. Mm -hmm. But I think that demographic shift is definitely going to be important going, going forward because obviously we have a higher dependency ratio. More people are going to re be retiring out of the labor market. Mm -hmm. um, obviously older cohorts have lower levels of schooling and lower levels of education. But I think as, as time goes on uh, and the educational profile of the retirees uh, increases, that's probably going to create a, 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 dem a displacement or a replacement effect that probably will drive down uh, over education. And I think the demographic, there will be a demographic tipping point, even with as the share of graduates uh, is increasing, but as the overall size of the cohort drops as a result of the lower birth rate kicking through, that is probably going to be an important factor, hopefully, uh, yeah, I mean, in mediating and, and, and driving this phenomenon down as time goes on. So thank you very much.